So I think we're going to get going. This is probably going to turn into more of a, a podcast than a session, but that's great. Um, <coughs> and um, we're waiting for one more speaker who will turn up um, shortly, who I think has been caught out on the metro. So um, to get going, I, I think I said this is, is going to be a bit of a sort of conversation. We'll see if anyone else is, is, is able to come along. I think obviously being scheduled straight after the music night is is it's it's the graveyard slot, but that's fine. Um, so the focus of this session is going to be on the global knowledge commons, a digital public good, and, and there's a couple of big terms in there. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at questions of, of definition um, in order to try and get a sense of what these are, and, and just as a, a prior warning. They're not necessarily particularly clearly defined. There aren't necessarily particularly agreed definitions of either of these things. Um, what I think is interesting and, and why we proposed this session in the first place is the fact that <coughs> while we often look at these questions in specific fields and specific subject areas, looking at them in the round, just as we look at the internet in the round, offers opportunities to think across the board, to think about cross-cutting actions, and in particular, what can be done in the internet governance space in order to actually protect this form of commons. Um, it's obviously particularly interesting um, for a library organization, which is what I represent. Um, libraries exist because of the belief, because of the, the understanding that access to information, that information is important, that it's something that can't be taken for granted that information should not be a factor of division or, or of inequality within society, but it should be something that's available to everyone so that everyone can learn, can grow, can develop with it. Um, <coughs> and clearly, you know, the, the internet, a lot of the initial ideas behind the internet were very much this idea, well, similarly, it can be the space where everyone can contribute, everyone can learn. Now, time's moved on, um, business models have developed, governance has developed, um, and clearly there are problems to address, but I think we would certainly argue that this function of, of the internet, as you know, as we called it in the 90s, the information superhighway, that actually this function of the internet is something that is important and is worth looking after. Um, so I promised a couple of um, definitions, but I think given the number of people in the room, I'm just going to go straight into the definitions and we'll make this more of a, a conversation between between those of us here. Um, um, so in terms of those definitions, the first one I wanted to share was from um, the Digital Cooperation Fact Sheet. This was a, a document put out in relation to the UN Secretary General's report on digital cooperation linked to around the time of our common agenda, which was very much the UN Secretary General's response to the declaration for the UN's 75th anniversary in 2020. Um, and one of the areas, one of the, the, one of the themes that was chosen as being particularly interesting for, um, was chosen as, chosen as being particularly interesting as an area for work at the UN level was digital public goods. And of, of course, I don't know, with any economics background, the whole idea of public goods is that these are things that are non-rivalrous, non-excludable, they bring benefits to people, but because of this, they need to be safeguarded, they need to be looked after, because otherwise no one will invest in them, they'll get overused, they'll get fall into disrepair, people will free ride. And what was interesting, in, in the definition of digital public goods given at, at that time, it talked about things like open source software, open data, open artificial intelligence models, but open standards, but what was interesting is they also mentioned open content. Um, since that time, I, I'd argue, or m the impression is that that last element has been a little bit forgotten sometimes. Um, groups like the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which are doing fantastic work and are bringing sort of really potentially powerful tools out to governments around the world to help improve public services, um, all of that work, nonetheless, is really focusing on open software and open standards and so on. And there's a lot less focus on open content in that space. And maybe that's understandable. It's easier to support the rollout of a new software system that improves governance, that improves benefit systems or whatever. Um, whereas open content is a much broader, much vaguer term and, and less easy to, to support so openly. But I think, importantly, 
the idea that open data, open content represent digital public goods is, is a useful one and I think points us in a useful direction. As said earlier, um, there have been efforts to look at these questions, to look at the, the topic of a knowledge commons at a more sectoral level already. And so we can start with education. And there was a, a really, really interesting report that came out from um, UNESCO again in 2021. Um, and this was in preparation for the Transforming Education Summit um, that then took place in 2022. And, and they brought together a panel of the great and the good to, to, to look at what needed to change and what were the crises in education, what needed to be overcome. And there's a really strong focus in there on how do you upgrade pedagogy? How do you change the way that you teach? And something that they really brought out and, and that really stood out for us, I think, was the idea that rather than seeing education as about being fed and being forced to consume quite a limited program of knowledge, quite a li limited program of ideas, was that rather the function of education was to give access to a knowledge commons. So, and this was described really as very, very broadly, a great human accomplishment that belongs to everyone, the full sum of knowledge. And so instead of rote learning, the idea was that students should be able to navigate this, not just navigate in terms of consuming, but also navigate in terms of contributing, adding things to the knowledge commons, taking humanity further in terms of its understanding of the world, its understanding of, 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 of life, and its understanding of how to improve things for everyone. Um, what's interesting in this reference is it also already highlights some of the issues and some of the questions around the knowledge commons. Um, the fact that there are significant exclusions and appropriations, certainly the way that um, traditionally knowledge has been seen has been quite exclusionary, that as long as knowledge comes from people who look like me, look white men from rich countries, it's been seen as being um, valuable and important. And if it comes from anyone else, it's not been seen as being recorded or we have imposed knowledge systems and, and ways of thinking that really aren't appropriate. So I don't know, this does usefully outline that I don't know, the knowledge commons, it's also something that does, just as the internet itself, it needs governance. We need to be paying attention. We need to be thinking about how is it, what's in there, what's working, are we taking account of different perspectives? So that's the education perspective. From the more cultural perspective, um, a lot of work has already been done about the importance of the public domain. And this is a, a line that comes from the Public Domain Manifesto that was created by the Communia Association within Europe. Um, and this focuses on it's quite a copyright related idea, um, public domain as all that falls outside of copyright. And of course, you can have a debate about whether copyright is an exception to the public domain or the public domain is an exception to copyright. Um, but here the idea is that it's that knowledge, those ideas that are not subject to controls, those, those areas of knowledge that are not, you don't have to seek permission, you don't have to seek authorization, you don't have to pay any money in order to it, use it. So there's really this idea of, of this, this bulk of knowledge that's available in order in turn to produce new knowledge and to produce new cultural work. So knowledge commons as a raw material for, for culture, for creativity. Um, of course, you know, this definition, I think one thing that, that's missing and that we, we may come on to it is the fact that there's also the uses of copyrighted works that are permitted under copyright exceptions, and that this also arguably helps feed the knowledge commons, even in the case of works that are not openly licensed or in the sort of public domain stricto sensu as, as suggested here. So that's the sort of more cultural side. Um, then there's the science side, and there's a lot of work that's been done around open scientific knowledge and this idea of um, the importance and the value of committing scientific knowledge as quickly as possible, more or less, to the public domain so that people can access, they can build on research data, metadata, open educational resources, I should mention in particular. Um, we would have had um, Zeynep Verolu from uh, UNESCO here, but it's 1.30 in the morning and she's already got to get up at 4 in the morning for another session, which is not a great, not particularly easy, um, uh, not a particularly easy one. Um, 
but again, from this sort of scientific perspective, there's a whole lot of work going on, the UNESCO Open Science recommendation that really focuses on the value, the possibilities that the internet creates in order to build up bases of science, scientific knowledge that can be built on. And a particularly valuable example is the work that was done by the National, Insti the, the National Health Library the National in at the National Institute of Medicine in the US, which really brought together data and information about COVID um, during the pandemic and presented this, made this available in a way that was actually really advanced, really accelerated the efforts to find treatments, to find remedies, to find vaccines to the COVID, vac to the COVID virus. And so again, it's this idea, it's a knowledge commons, it's open, it's there, it's available, but it needed to be curated to be governed. Um, however, and this is a deliberately blank slide, um, there's nothing about the knowledge commons, there's nothing protecting or upholding the availability, the possibility for people to access knowledge. There's no, there's not necessarily any cross-cutting, underlining, cross-cutting emphasis on why open access to knowledge, why having a knowledge commons available for all is important and making sure it's safe from being foreclosed, it's safe from being enclosed um, at the global level. And so we don't have any protection right now, which ra sort of raises the question of, well, whose job is it? What can we actually do in order to safeguard this and to make sure that as a commons, we don't end up with it being lost without, and don't end up with it being the subject of underinvestment, and we don't end up simply losing it in the big scheme of things. So to look into this a little bit more, um, I'm very glad to be joined by um, Tomoake Watanabe from um, Creative Commons Japan and Amalia Toledo from the Wikimedia Foundation, who are going to share just a a few ideas from their perspective as, as two of the sort of really significant global knowledge commons organizations um, to get a sense of what they're doing, of I don't know, what it means, why you think it's important, what are the crises that are currently being faced around the knowledge commons, um, whether you think these are being taken seriously enough, and what action you think can be taken in the internet governance space. So um, let's start, start with the first question. So Tom Walker, you please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what that Global Knowledge Commons means for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Tomoaki Watanabe. Uh, I have been uh, part of uh, Creative Commons Japan team. Uh, as, a, as a citizen, I have been volunteering uh, to promote sharing of informational resources, some um, cultural, others educational, yet others scientific. Uh, and some other kinds. Um, uh, also, uh, my day job is a, a, a researcher as a, as at an academic uh, institution, as a, as a, a researcher at uh, an institution called GLOCOM, Center for Global Communications. And there, I al also have some uh, opportunities to, to delve into openness-related issues. And uh, from my perspective, or from my experience, I think we have a really uh, interesting rising opportunity in relation to especially the public domain, uh, which is that um, when we think about the kind of uh, informational resources generated by machines, uh, let's say, uh, surveillance cameras, uh, some of those footages are almost uh, as good as some of the casually taken video clips uh, generated by human uh, or created by humans. And there, it's interestingly, it's kind of difficult to distinguish what's machine generated uh, or automatically uh, generated video clips and what's human created, which is uh, the latter is uh, subject to the copyright protection. Uh, the same thing or quite similar thing could be said about uh, the produ products of generative AIs. Uh, we have potentially really cornucopia of 
uh, informational resources generated by these AIs, texts, music, other sound clips, and of course uh, images and videos. Um, and then um, maybe soon enough we have uh, three-dimensional data uh, using 3D scanners, uh, uh, producing all kinds of like things, uh, shapes of uh, all kinds of objects. And again, uh, so many of those things, um, I think we do not necessarily uh, see copyright in those data. A AI, it depends on the, uh, the legal systems under which the AI is uh, operating, but um, so in a sense, we will, we are about to get a really abundant uh, information resources, uh, free of uh, copyright restrictions, uh, free to reuse for any purposes. However, uh, it's also interestingly, uh, the same phenomenon can be uh, described from a different angle that uh, it's, it's very difficult to distinguish sometimes what's human created, what's machine generated. And uh, because of that, uh, we have increasing risk of mistaking public domain materials as copyrighted materials or vice versa. Um, and in a way, I'm, I'm wondering or I'm uh, worrying that um, unless we have some convenient way to distinguish one from the other, um, and this, I think, is one piece of answer to your blank slide, um, unless we have some convenient means to distinguish one from the other, um, many people might end up seeing the public domain materials as potentially infringing uh, potentially human created, um, not easy to use kind of resources. And that's such a big missed opportunity if that happens. So I think we need something, um, some probably not just law, but some kind of system to, to be able to tell uh, or some kind of practice to be able to tell for many people, okay, this is something I can use without worrying too much about the legal restrictions. So that's, I guess, my initial answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I, I was we were talking to someone from WIPO yesterday who was exactly complaining about a lack of consideration of this at IGF. So it's, um, he'll be very glad to hear that someone's finally bringing up the copyright implications of AI here. Thank you, and Amalia. Um, thank you so much, Stephen, for, for the invitation. I will try to make much sense, uh, myself, any sense. I don't know if I can make it because my jet lag and so on is, is still hitting hard. Um, I'm Amalia Toledo from the Wikimedia Foundation, um, the public, poli public policy specialist for Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'm based in Bogota, Colombia, that's why. I'm suffering jet lag. Um, in any case, um, as for anyone that doesn't know, the Wikimedia Foundation is the global nonprofit organization that supports Wikipedia and other digital projects for free knowledge. Um, and the foundation provides the technical infrastructure and support hundreds of volunteers who contribute to Wikipedia and these other projects. Um, while perhaps stating this is obvious, uh, I think it's important to point out that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, uh, not a social media platform or an opinion page. And those who share knowledge on Wikipedia collaborate, debate, and discuss their edits to write thoughtful and informative articles. Um, and they embrace the spirit, of, the spirit of collaboration across national borders um, to provide the most accurate information possible. Um, but in addition to creating the content on Wikipedia, they set and enforce rules about what should be, um, what should be there or not. <laughs> um, so 
the content um, of the Wikipedia, Wikimedia projects, uh, whether text, images, data, or otherwise, is created and developed under a Creative Commons open license and is, uh, by definition, part of the digital commons. Um, everyone, everywhere, uh, can access, reuse, remix uh, that content and participate in, in its development to, to advance the foundation goals of uh, contributing to the sum of all knowledge. And this vision and the openness of the Wikimedia projects uh, make it um, resources and, and contact a global public good. Um, so basically to answer to your first questions, <laughs> that's what all this means for to us. <laughs> um, it's about, we are about this. <laughs> um, but as more services and information sources come online, access to digital public spaces and, and repository of knowledge and memory is becoming increasingly important to participate in public life. And the ability to access and share knowledge can create so social welfare and promote social equity. Uh, but we know that barriers to access often amplify existing inequalities and there are many barriers to access uh, to knowledge and information. Hence, that's why we believe that there is a need for a robust public information infrastructure that helps safeguard uh, global public goods um, as collecting and sharing information helps fulfill the promise of the internet as a digital public good. And, and this requires not only investment in technical infrastructure, but also um, support for the fields that produce and organize knowledge, um, like you know, journalism, academia, uh, cultural heritage, heritage institution, libraries, just to name a few. <laughs> uh, and this support also extends to legal structures and, and the open and free licensing of many different types of information. Um, and just to finalize with you know, the first, probably the first question, um, digital commons such as Wikipedia and other, on the other Wikimedia projects should be supported because they are public goods and they contribute to the development of the SDA, SDG. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I think, I know, <coughs> I, I know the work's been done, but also that development within Wikimedia of sort of community-based rules I don't know it's sort of Eleanor Ostrom at, at work, and it's a fantastic sort of other than lobster fisherman in Nantucket Bay. It's great to have a sort of a, a modern version of that so that you can actually sort of see how this works. Um, coming on to to that question of what what potentially the crises are that we need to look at, and t Tom Walker, you sort of started talking about this and talking about some of the the risks that whereas there's this huge potential that digital technology and, and the internet as a digital technology brings to, to make a huge amount of content available. You talked a little bit about the risk of when there's a lack of certainty, when people aren't sure you know, what's human, what's AI, and the risk of the AI, the sort of the, the, the machine generated being sort of subject to doubt and concern. Do you want to dig a little bit more into that as, as one of the potential crises facing the knowledge commons? Okay, so uh, let me expand the scope of the, the risk that I perceive a little bit. Um, in the digital archives space, I see uh, many institutions around the world uh, using Creative Commons licenses uh, to signal, well, look, this, let's say, faithful reproduction of some two-dimensional painting uh, digitized by some museum um, is restricted uh, even though the original work, the painting, uh, is in the public domain. Uh, the license indicates that, oh, the usage is, say, only for non-commercial uses. And and so in a way, I see that risk is not theoretical, but it's already happening in some other uh, neighboring or adjacent space spaces. And there, uh, the 
the the the people so so the stakeholders the the main stakeholder is thing, uh, things like museums they say okay we need to spend money invest some money into digitizing digitizing these things and we need some recognition or we need some some returns uh, not necessarily monetary returns, but even though sometimes they do want monetary returns, um, at least some recognition or, you know, they wanted to um, learn more about how the, the works are used. And so they do introduce some uh, restrictions, even though legally speaking, um, museums are not copyright holders of those paintings, digitized paintings. So, so um, it's quite questionable on what, what, what kind of ground, legal ground, they, they do in, introduce uh, CC licenses into these images. But regardless, they do it anyway. And it's happening around the world. And I think in a way, uh, there is, um, this is a sign that we need some kind of uh, signaling mechanism. Uh, what kind of parties contributed to the uh, enrichment, maintenance, or expansion of global knowledge commons? Uh, and what kind of rewards they wish to receive? Um, and I don't think uh, there is a good amount of legal justification to grant them new type of rights. I, I think, however, I think uh, to, uh, to a reasonable extent, let's say, uh, they deserve some kind of credits. Um, I don't think, um, so in, let's say, uh, put it other, another way. I don't think it's good to legally require users of those images uh, to give credits to those uh, institutions like museums. However, it's, it's okay that museums request uh, without legal force uh, that they would like to receive uh, a credit. And things like that, just small things in a way, uh, could improve uh, the motivations of relevant parties and ease of use of those materials uh, greatly. And I see, I see such potential. And I think there is a similar potential uh, related to the AI-generated materials. Uh, so, so in that sense, um, I see a crisis, but I see maybe I see there is some possibility somewhere around here. If we have good usable or easy to use standardized way to signal what kind of wishes uh, people related to this, this piece of um, resource or that piece of resource has, and then maybe without really introducing onerous legal restrictions, which could compromise the reusability um, and access eventually, um, maybe we can benefit from the potentially expanding knowledge commons. Did I answer your question? That, that, that was, an, it, it touches good, on, thank you. It, 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 that, no, that was really good. It touched on question four as well, but that I didn't, and I don't know, it, it, it is a tragedy of the commons. <laughs> scenario that there's a risk of, of either free riding or people not feeling recognized. I think it also underlines quite how dumb copyright can be. And it's a very blunt instrument. It incentivizes people to monetize and extract revenues when actually that may not be the motivating factor. But I, I think, yeah, finding that middle way between providing an incentive without creating a barrier which copyright is really bad at, <laughs> is, is, is a really powerful point. Amalia. Yeah, in terms of uh, crisis and to add to what my colleague has said, um, I think we can talk about at least, I can talk about at least three 
different crises here, um, and and also all crises that I can see from my part of the world. <laughs> um, for for instance, there's less investment in uh, digital infrastructure. Um, there is a crisis of sustainability of institutions that create and organize uh, knowledge, and a regula regulatory trend of uh, digital platforms that um, for to regulate digital platforms. Sorry, that seems to only look at the damage caused by the large, the major uh, big techs. Um, the, technology companies and, and that often do not take into account the Wikimedia model. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, if you go deep into at least this, I'm just naming a few ones, I guess there are many other ones, but at least from the part of the world I am, I can see this tree. Uh, you see the states that um, with very minimal exceptions uh, have not invested in digital public infra infrastructure. Uh, uh, instead, uh, they, they are increasingly acquiring and purchasing uh, proprietary tech, uh, and you know, in the name of this vicious, um, vacuous digital transformation narrative uh, that is basically designed to gain votes. <laughs> it's not actually designed to empower people uh, and to solve uh, um, needs in in in, in their societies. Um, then you have, when I talk about the crisis of sustainability um, of institutions, of knowledge institutions, I think this has been even worse now after the pandemic, where many budget, uh, the budgets were cut for um, cultural institutions, for instance, uh, institutions that in the Americas, in the Latin American region, are already very precarious. <laughs> so that's also for me a big crisis where the institutions don't, these institutions don't even have the budget, the funding, and the resources and the um, human capital to, you know, even to digitize <laughs> their um, their works, their collections. Um, and we saw that in the in the Latin American region. Suddenly, museums, archives, and everything were like, "What are we going to do? We are closing, and we don't even have our collections online, and people that cannot even access this." And and that was pity. Uh, and of course, education as well is suffering from the same. And and when I talk about the third one about um, this uh, regulatory landscape, we see more and more um, regulatory proposals uh, that instead of helping a model that has 20 years that have proved to be good <laughs> for society and that can be even better if we provide for uh, a regulatory landscape that allows people, enables people to participate online, um, to create knowledge uh, collectively. Instead, we have regulations that are, are basically because they're only thinking on one type of model, the centralized commercialized model, uh, the, we are risking to change the whole decentralized community-led model uh, that we have at Wikimedia. And, and that's, for us, is another one with people don't feel like they can, they are empowered to participate online. They are not empowered to, uh, uh, to create knowledge, to be able to come up with their own set of rules of what they wanted to, um, how they wanted to manage uh, information online, then, you know, it, I'm not saying we are perfect, but at least <laughs> we have proof to, uh, to work and, and, and the regulator regulatory proposals around the world are not thinking about this and not making uh, anything to make this possible, you know, and um, so yeah, just, wanted to mention these three, but I guess there are many other crises that we can talk to. <laughs> I, I, we'll, we'll get on to that, but I, I know that, you know, in particular, that, that I think this is firstly the point about the lack of funding crosses over very nicely with what Tom Waki said, that there is, you know, there is the public domain conceptually, but it's not very public because it's stuck within an institution and no one's yet found the money to digitise it. Um, I think that point about... Um, <coughs> no, no, it's an interesting argument to have in, in the context of the IGF, but we see it a lot that people regulate the internet as if it was just YouTube or Facebook, 
and and systematically we've seen in, in Europe and I think I know I'm, I'm the only European here, which is a, a nicely rare situation. Um, we've seen in Europe massive efforts taken to regulate the internet through legislation when actually probably competition, like you attack the market power of one company rather than trying to make general rules in a really clumsy way that then treats the whole internet as if it was a major American tech firm and forgets that you have public interest things. And so for example, the, the situation we've seen with the really inconsistent treatment of open access repositories, that they're excluded in um, the Digital Servant Single Market Act, but in Digital Services Act, I eh, don't really know, not really included, and there's no treatment of them elsewhere, and, and that's a sort of problem that the, the treatment is really um, <coughs> um, uneven. So um, we have people in the room now, which is, oh, Tom Waikie, you're going to react. Just one additional comment. I, I have been kind of trying to clarify my ideas. So, so I think um, when, Stephen, when you said, you know, th this is public good, so there's a risk of tragedy of commons. I see that, and yeah, um, I see that uh, there's a risk of underfunding this kind of stuff very easily, very typical of public good. Um, but then, if we try to introduce the property rights into this, like intellectual property rights, like copyright, um, I think there is a risk of now causing kind of tragedy of anti-commons, where many people have some rights to say, oh, you cannot use, use this resource for this purpose, or you have to um, meet this condition, and then the resources eventually becomes kind of not so useful anymore. Um, and so my sense is that introducing new copyright may not be the smartest of the solutions that we can think of. Thank you. I, I, I think, I don't know, I know uh, uh, Amalia and I have spent plenty of time at WIPO trying to say that maybe more copyright isn't the answer. <laughs> um, I know, it, it's, it's a dumb instrument. It works for some things, but the idea of creating a market um, through exclusion is, it's a model of working <laughs> that, that doesn't necessarily fulfill the public interest or it assumes that the market works perfectly. So we, we have 13 minutes and I have promised that we will end on time also because we have other people there. Um, what I will do quickly actually, I will, I'm just interested in, um, I'm going to go back to the slide that I had <coughs> at the beginning ju just to, to give the audience a, 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 a moment to sort of feed in where you are or your sort of sense or your understanding and familiarity with these issues. Um, it's on Menti, so if you just go to menti.com and use the tiny code at the top, and if anyone needs me to read it out, um, it's tiny. So it's 64756559. But while we're doing that, I also wanted to open up in case there are questions. I think, Maria, there's one question online. Yes, we have a question. Well, we have two questions online. One of them is from Ayale Shebeshi on how the UN IGF internationally regulates knowledge common to as a global use. But I think he would like to clarify, so I don't know if it's possible to unmute him. Uh, um, I'll ask our technical colleagues to see if we can unmute uh, ILL. Let me see if I can. I think, I think, I think we can. So I, I, I allow you, you have the floor. Okay, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much uh, give me this opportunity. My name is Ayala Ushibeshi. Uh, I'm from Australia. Um, basically, I came from uh, Ethiopia. I'm doing research on um, fiat, how we move uh, from fiat um, uh, currency to uh, digital fiat currency or CDBC. Uh, that's my area. I just finished my master's in information and communication technology and uh, cyber security. So to clarify my question, um, the advanced technology such as AI, 
the blockchain, IoT, EOT, NFT, NFC, quantum computing, they all are generated data and information, which is information is data anyway. I'm not gonna go detail that. So these days, uh, data or information is a wealth, which is a knowledge, knowledge is a wealth. So how we regulate um, this vast amount of knowledge, the current uh, uh, knowledge or the current uh, tendency of, uh, of uh, UN activity is based on a developed countries rules and the regulation which is highly structured. So we need to use uh, both hard skill and soft skill to make this um, knowledge common into a global use. That will be included, uh, inclusive for a global south. I'm sure uh, you know this uh, currently, uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, a different uh, 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 trends is coming, especially in the financial sector, which is a SWIFT system and the BRICS system. I'm sure some of you, uh, you have an old, I'm, I'm, I'm understood that you have information and knowledge or um, overview about what's going on on the BRICS side of the world now. So um, instead, of, um, instead of using highly structured soft skill, a hard skill, we need to use uh, a soft skill. So uh, by um, the, my question, um, I'm sure the answer, um, uh, uh, the panels or the, the other um, participant can answer my question, but uh, as you gave me this opportunity, I might just um, forward the two questions, uh, two suggestions that um, I think in my understanding, the UN can take, um, uh, uh, action. Um, one, uh, establish common standard for international uh, regulations that all UN members participate and agree to be inclusive to use uh, uh, knowledge common. And the second one is we need to educate uh, because of this is uh, knowledge is a culture and um, uh, as I, uh, uh, I read from the uh, presenters, um, it is related to the culture, uh, data is related to the culture and we use this technology, technology is, um, is actually reaching now uh, uh, each corner of the, the globe and the globe is now is a global village. So uh, we to use this, we need to establish education. That education is based on the uh, current trend. Uh, most of the technology is developed by uh, stakeholders, which is the Western based stakeholders. We need to educate these stakeholders in a soft skill based uh, education. Uh, so UN can um, uh, uh, initiate uh, education wise to all the globes, which is a global village, not only the, the, the Western or Eastern or developed countries, it has to be rich in South, especially global South, undeveloped countries. Thank there you. is a lot of resources, there is a lot of knowledge. So I finish this now and thank you uh, so much for giving me this opportunity. Th th thank you very much. And I think that's a, oh. sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> mute colleague's computer. Um, Th thank you very much. It, it, it's actually it's something we, you'll have seen the slide flash past very quickly, but I, I think there was something really interesting in the UNESCO definition of underlining that currently the knowledge commons is not, it's far from perfect, that it contains a lot of biases, a lot of assumptions um, that uh, t to a large extent, I don't know, what, what we have considered to be valid knowledge or knowledge full stop has been what's been produced by people who look like me and come from countries like mine, um, and that there's a pretty serious need to actually reassess that. I, I don't know, Tom, and, and I know actually in, in Amalia, there's been some really interesting work with Wikimedia to, I think, working with Wayu in Guajira in, in Colombia. I know David has been involved in that and actually looking at how you take indigenous knowledge systems <laughs> 
and find a way of mixing, of, of including that in a way that sort of protects interests. I don't know if you want to comment. And then we've got Mark's question, which we'll respond to. <laughs> well, one of the great things about Wikipedia is that it's organized by languages and, and there's a chance there for minority languages to have a space online <laughs> where they can um, preserve their language and also try to thrive, <laughs> even though there are a small group of people. Um, so this example of Colombia is a beautiful one. It's a group of an indigenous group um, at the border um, with um, Venezuela. There are Venezuelans and Colombians uh, that came together and worked very hard for many years to see how to um, um, implement uh, uh, Wikipedia, which is the language of, of this uh, indigenous uh, community um, and there is uh, as far as I know from the my colleagues that works on this I'm just an spectator of, of the project not I'm not involved in that project um, it's uh, it, it's been a great opportunity for this community to come together um, uh, to think about how they can preserve the language and how they can use Wikipedia and the Wikimedia the other Wikimedia projects to teach their language as well to younger generations. And, and as far as I know, they are um, right now in collaboration with uh, the Ministry of Education in Colombia uh, to uh, work on educational op open resources uh, in their languages that and using all this infrastructure provided by the, by the Wikimedia projects uh, um, to support all these ex efforts. So, so it's actually quite good that then you have this community and their knowledge being online finally and people can you know relate to them see it how it grows and 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 learn about their the culture it's great and and I, didn't, I like that because it's also it's a group i know it's the community building those so it's very much i know it's, it's from the community and and, and so it's that that's the merit of the infrastructure is it does allow that to happen and allow it to happen in a way that's sensitive and that people can actually own. D did you want to add anything to Arke and then? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I have to say I'm still learning about um, indigenous um, issues in general. Um, from what I see, uh, from where I see the things, um, it seems that sometimes um, it's not that I'm totally against this kind of things, but um, it seems that sometimes uh, people of uh, uh, maintaining indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge resources, they don't want their resources to be globally shared um, or if shared, uh, they do want to be um, uh, receiving some kind of benefits uh, or some kind of returns, um, and so and and also um, sometimes they do not want that the the way mm, how do you say the very individualistic way based on intellectual property <coughs> rights to govern the knowledge. Um, not that I'm against it, but it's it's quite different that I feel like um, it's not very easy, at least for me, who is not very much experienced, uh, to 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 think of some common regime or system. Uh, both domains can agree on. And some people more um, experienced with the traditional knowledge resources uh, even suggested that they should actually, um, we should actually not meddle with what they are doing and just let them be the way they are and, and uh, not just, or in a way, respect the way they are doing. Um, and maybe that's an answer, maybe not. I'm still, again, again, I, I come back to the point that I'm still learning, I guess. Thank you. 
think, you know, I, I guess that comes down to the concept of governance, full stop, that it's not one single entity deciding everything. There's the possibility to have a number of actors and a number of systems within it, and, and it, it's easy to embrace that complexity. Th there was a question from Mark about um, contributions to the work and the Global Digital Compact about... Um, <coughs> about the scope and content uh, around promoting confidence, trust, and rights protection in digital knowledge commons, and in particular in AI-generated resources. Um, we certainly fed in um, the first round of consultations that took place last year, and I think underlining, first of all, that AI-generated content <coughs> shouldn't be covered by copyright, that it, it wasn't appropriate in that situation. <coughs> I think we've also taken the, the position that it's concerning that once you have legitimate access to knowledge that then there should also be downstream control over how it's used economically I don't know, but there's plenty of arguments to say that I don't know a deep fake that makes someone look like they're saying something they haven't raises moral rights issues but downstream control is, is kind of concerning I, I, Mark you, you, you may be involved in the UK discussions on this but it appears that I don't know a, a situation that ends up with current rights holders actually owning basically the AI generated products downstream isn't necessarily a great solution and anything that reduces the amount of data available for training AI risks actually reducing the quality of what comes out which doesn't seem like a great way to promote product safety in the first place so you know we, we do I know we have focused on that but thank you for the input on things coming forward in January and the need to input there. Um, I'm conscious we're one minute past when we were supposed to finish. Um, please do come and talk to us afterwards, but I think there's, I, know, I think we have some good recommendations coming out around the importance of finding something less clumsy than copyright and finding a way beyond copyright here because it's not a particularly well-suited solution to doing this. I think um, the importance of investing in the infrastructures and making sure that we aren't forgetting that as any public good, it requires investment, otherwise people will free ride. Um, the importance that ILEV talked about of um, thinking about uh, education and promoting this as an idea. I think some sort of an, uh, an idea that I felt was coming out about um, making sure that it doesn't get forgotten and really resisting this temptation to regulate the internet as if it was just YouTube is kind of important because if you regulate the internet as if it's YouTube, you only end up with YouTube, which is not really a good solution <laughs> for anyone. Um, yep, so I think I, I will be able to fill in the highlights I need to deliver within two hours to the IGF Secretariat, which is a good outcome for me. So thank you everyone for turning up. Thank you for, for getting in after music night. It's all appreciated. Thanks so much.